We took off two days out. Of course, uh, we had mated the lunar module and the command module together. I had a television camera in my hand, and I was going into the lunar module with uh, Fred Hayes. I was photographing Fred uh, uh, as he looked at the lunar module and tried to determine if everything was in there, the food, the flight plans. Uh, we had, uh, were beaming the, the uh, program back to the Earth, but this was the third lunar landing mission. None of the networks carried it. Even the controllers in mission control were waiting for us to stop the program because they wanted to get back to the ball game that was going on in Houston that night. And then, of course, we heard the bang. Uh, the spacecraft rocked back and forth. We didn't know what happened. Uh, we saw lights come on, warning lights come on. We lost our electrical power in one of our buses. Lost two out of three of our fuel cells. They are devices that make electrical power out of oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, and then I saw a gas escaping from the rear end of my spacecraft and noticed that the quantity gauges on my two oxygen tanks, one read zero, and the other one I could actually see the needle go down, uh, something you would never see in the normal usage of oxygen. And that's when the old lead weight went down to the bottom of my stomach, and I thought that we were really in deep trouble. There was crises going on all the time, and we had to overcome each crisis as we came up to it. One of them was the fact that obviously we didn't have enough electrical power to get home, uh, and so we had to shut everything down. And consequently, we were really flying by the seat of our pants. And uh, without all those exotic electronic devices that you wouldn't be caught out there without, you know, the, the computer or the guidance system or the digital autopilot, all those things uh, were shut off to save power. And all we really had in the way of devices was the radio to talk to the Earth and a little fan that circulated the atmosphere in the spacecraft. The lunar module was never designed to fly with a dead command and service module on it. The command and service module was designed to fly with the lunar module attached, but not vice versa. I literally had to learn to fly all over again because the lunar module systems were designed that the center of gravity would be somewhat in the middle of the lunar module except that the center of gravity moved way out to that command service module. And so when I used the handle to pitch down, the vehicle to pitch down, it went off in some wild gyration because the, it, the controls were all different. And uh, it took me, oh, several hours to find out how to control the vehicle uh, to make sure, uh, to make it go where I wanted it to go. Well, the accident is a classic aircraft accident, which if you and I was an old accident investigator for airplanes. Uh, if you look back at it, it was caused by a series of events that overcame either the pilot and or the spacecraft, or the airplane in the case of an airplane. The accident was set up five years before we took off. At that time, NASA told all of the contractors to make the spacecraft compatible with, I think it was 65 volt DC power available at Cape Kennedy even though the spacecraft batteries on fuel cells produced 28-volt power, and that's what we flew with. But the higher voltage at the Cape would allow certain tests to be done a lot quicker. So they said, just make all the systems compatible to handle the higher voltage. Everybody did, except the company or the fellow that built the heating system in the oxygen tank. That little heater, which was a combination heater and a fan to stir up the liquid oxygen, and a heater was used in case the pressure dropped a little bit. You could turn on the heater system. The liquid would boil off and build the pressure to keep feeding the fuel cells and the, keep the spacecraft pressurized and, and you know, oxygen and breathe. Uh, the thermostat in that heater system was compatible with only 28-volt power. That was the original design of the thermostat. They never replaced it with one that would be compatible with 65-volt power. That was the first incident that occurred. Now, that discrepancy was on all the flights from Apollo 8 all the way through Apollo 13. Several weeks before the launch, we did what was known as a countdown demonstration test. We got in the spacecraft. The crew got there. All the other people got there, the, the controllers. We counted the spacecraft that rocket down to zero, but we did not launch just to make sure that everything was all set to go, everybody knew what they were supposed to do, all the consumables except the, the fuel in the, uh, the rocket itself wasn't put in. But the oxygen in these tanks was put in. 
after the test was completed and everything did work perfectly for the flight, the ground crew went in to remove the oxygen from the two oxygen tanks. They hooked up a gaseous oxygen hose to the fill line, forced gas through. That gas was supposed to push the liquid out the vent line. But when that started, the gas going in went out and the liquid stayed right where it's supposed to. Well, the ground crew couldn't figure out what was wrong. So they then went back and looked at the schematics of the tank and looked at its history. They found out that it was dropped at the factory. They found out that there was a tube that was in there that was used specifically only to detank the tank, you know, in testing. Never, to, you know, it wouldn't be ever used in, in flight. And they saw that if it was dropped and this tube was loosened, it would give, give the symptoms that they now saw. Someone got the idea, well, why don't we turn on the heater system? It's in the tank. We'll boil the oxygen out. After all, the tank worked perfectly for everything in flight. The only thing we couldn't do was remove the oxygen after a test, which we never have to do in flight anyway. Everybody agreed that said that's not a bad idea. Let's just turn on the heater system and, and, and uh, boil out the oxygen. They did turn on the heater system. There were two ways of testing how hot this heater would get. On the, lo on the control stand or the test stand, there was a gauge, a temperature gauge. Now, the little thermostat was supposed to operate at about 80 degrees. If I got up to 80 degrees, the little contacts of the thermostat would open up, shutting off the power so it wouldn't get too hot. The temperature gauge to check how hot the, this uh, heater system got was calibrated only up to 80 degrees. Another thing we had, we had telemetry, a little readout, a little line that would go along, and when the power dropped off, it would go to zero, and then when the thermostat closed again to turn the power back on, it would go on to one. It ran continuously for eight hours. No one ever checked that. Several other things happened in the design of 13 and the construction that led to the accident. One was the fact that when the oxygen tanks were being put into the service module of Apollo 10, not 13, uh, they dropped the tank. Not far, just a couple inches, they dropped the tank. And consequently, they took it out, checked it all over again, but never checked to see, after they put liquid oxygen in the tank, that they could detank it, which is a way you, you do uh, in just in testing, to, to push gaseous oxygen in and force the liquid out. Uh, but everything else worked perfectly. Now that tank was then recycled, not to Apollo 10, but to Apollo 13. 